Um, as I mentioned, I have no disclosures. We'll just start again. And this is a 64 year old male with greater trochanteric pain. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he, he's a jogger. He's also a custodian. It's worse going up and down steps. Pain uh, at night lying on that affected side. He was referred to physical therapy. There was some improvement, but still has a fair amount of pain uh, with jogging. And so he was referred to our musculoskeletal ultrasound department for a diagnostic ultrasound with uh, uh, referral stating, you know, Ruach uh, GM tear. So that's the presentation of the case. Now, greater token tear pain has been an interest of mine. When I first started ultrasound, uh, for me, I had a fair amount of referrals for lateral hip pain. And, and as I was scanning patients, the, the pieces of the puzzle just really didn't fit together for me. I was struggling to find the right angles and such. So it became a little bit of a interest in mine uh, to try to understand those pieces of the puzzle. And so that's essentially what I'm gonna to present today is, is some of my interest um, in reviewing our protocol as well as those images, discuss lateral hip pathology, and then as we're doing in this case series, we're gonna review the ultrasound report. Now, I thank you as an order uh, to Jay Smith and the Mayo Clinic, um, because I was, uh, through that uh, <clears throat> collaboration, I was able to use the Mayo lab uh, to do a couple studies and understand some of those pieces of the puzzle and hopefully at least in some respect, put those together. So again, I thank you as an order. All right, so my lateral hip protocol actually starts with the anterior hip. Um, and this is, is how I designed it from the beginning. And uh, after a number of years of doing this, it's reinforced that starting with the anterior hip is important to put all the pieces of puzzle together. And so with the anterior hip, um, I look at the joint, I look at the labrum and several muscles. It's not as detailed as let's say my protocol for an anterior hip exam. Um, and it doesn't take much time, um, but again, I think it's important. And then laterally, I, I focus on five structures uh, as the baseline, and that would be the greater trochanter itself, the IT band at two different levels, gluteus minimus, both bands of the gluteus medius, and then the bursa. So we're going to jump into the anterior hip, um, and there's two reasons why I choose to start with the anterior hip exam, and the first is that I have learned over time that uh, hip joint abnormalities can present as lateral hip pain. So probably once a month, it's a very common scenario where a patient presents with lateral hip pain. They've already had an injection uh, into the lateral hip with suboptimal results, and they're referred for GME tear um, as a cause of not improving with the injection. Um, and it turns out that most commonly hip osteoarthrosis uh, is the underlying etiology proven with uh, an injection into the hip joint. Uh, a minor reason is, is by adding the anterior hip, uh, we more complete, uh, completely uh, meet the criteria for a complete exam because we're now including in the joint and if we need to, um, there's certainly several nerves in the anterior hip. As mentioned in the first couple cases, it's important to obtain and or review radiographs prior to starting the sonographic study. Uh, and so this is the radiographs in our gentleman and right away we see that there is some hip osteoarthrosis. Um, and so that's one of the first things I scrutinize is the joint itself uh, before starting the ultrasound. The second is I scrutinize the greater trochanter. And we see in this gentleman, it's fairly smooth. And I look at the degree of cortical regularities. I also look for uh, bony ossicles or heterotopic bone that might be adjacent to uh, the greater trochanter, which is oftentimes confusing uh, on ultrasound unless you already are prepared to see this from the radiograph. And so here's uh, images for the anterior hip. And I always start with a long axis of the joint and the anterior recess of the joint, looking for thickening of fusions. And then I slide my probe proximal to look at the anterior labrum and try to get the full width of the anterior labrum. So you see in this gentleman, uh, there is a extensive degenerative type labral tear of the anterior labrum. Then I slide over, my, I take the, in the long axis orientation and slide medially to get the long axis of the iliopsoas tendon. And then I turn the probe 90 degrees to get the short axis. Now, I, I could argue we probably don't need the long axis if we're evaluating the lateral hip if we have a normal short axis, but I do a 
a fair amount of uh, ultrasounds for patients who have had pain after a hip arthroplasty, looking for hip impingement. And so it's just kind of second nature for us uh, to do this. So we just keep it in the protocol. Now it's beyond the scope of this case, but you should think of the iliopsoas as a complex um, and has a fair amount of heterogeneity. Um, so if you're doing a lot of anterior hip work, it's worth digging into that and understanding the complex. Now, after our second case series, one of our colleagues uh, made a comment that it might be uh, useful uh, to present some of the report as you go along. Um, and so I'm gonna try that today. And so I generally, um, the majority of, of my cases for lateral hip have three paragraphs in the body of my dictation. The first paragraph is the anterior hip. And so it would start out, there was no hip joint effusion. And there's a degenerative type tear of the anterior acetabular labrum vessel. And then to finish off the anterior hip, uh, we include the rectus femoris. And as you know, there's a, a direct head onto the anterior inferior iliac spine and then a reflected head. Um, and again, uh, this is not the focus of the evaluation. If it looks normal, I just stop right here. And then I slide over to the, the sartorius and the ASIS uh, and look at that insertion. And you can see here that there are enthesiopathic changes at the sartorius insertion onto the ASIS. So we see this as hypochoic thickening. We have some alteration or loss of fibular echo texture in this case. And so the completing the first paragraph of my report, I mentioned that the degenerative type tear, the iliopsoas and rectus femoris muscle tendon units are normal. And then there is hypochoic thickening with alteration of fibular echo texture at the insertion of the sartorius muscle tendon unit onto the anterior superior X spine. Now I think it's quite reasonable and useful uh, when we do ultrasounds uh, to report uh, in a situation like this, whether there's pain with sonopalpation. Obviously, the older a patient gets, the more we're going to find asymptomatic findings. And so I say in my report, there is no corresponding pain with sonopalpation at the ASIS. And I think that's an important piece of information. So that completes my anterior hip. And then <clears throat> I slide over to the lateral hip. I do my anterior hip exam with the patient supine. And then I'll do my lateral hip exam in this case in the left lateral decubitus. Um, and I always start, as mentioned, with the greater trochanter itself in the bone. So let's just quickly review the bony anatomy. And as all, you all know, uh, there's four facets of the greater trochanter. We have the anterior, we have a fairly broad triangular lateral facet uh, with peaked on top of the superior posterior facet, and then posteriorly, the posterior facet. Now the tendinous attachments, um, again, as you most know, just reviewing um, on the anterior facet is a tendinous attachment of the gluteus minimus. We have a bare zone where there's no tendinous attachment onto a portion of the lateral facet and the anterior band of the gluteus medius attaches onto the posterior aspect of the lateral facet. And again, uh, cephalide to that is the attachment of the posterior band onto the superior posterior facet. And again, as you know, the posterior facet itself is bare, uh, but covered by the greater trochanteric bursa. And you can see in our gentleman here that the greater trochanter looks fairly pristine for his age and being a runner, um, there was really no cortical irregularities or abnormalities. Now I'm gonna just, again, review um, how I get this image. And the natural tendency is when we examine uh, the, the lateral hip is to stay in anatomic planes. And it, the lateral hip is often referred to as a rotator cuff um, of the hip uh, for many reasons. Uh, and one of them is when we evaluate the shoulder, we're often not in uh, anatomic planes. And this very much is true for the lateral hip. And so if we have the probe oriented anatomic transverse, we're essentially oblique uh, to all the important structures. We're oblique to the face of the anterior facet. We're oblique uh, to the insertion on the posterior aspect of the lateral facet of the anterior band of the G med. And so by rotating the probe um, in an anatomic uh, axial oblique with the posterior aspect of the probe cephalad to the anterior aspect, now we're matching perpendicular the face of the anterior facet and we're just about 
testicular, which would be, the, again, the short axis of the insertion of the anterior B band of the G med. And so that's exactly the proposition that I obtained this structure. Now, even though we're focusing on the greater trochanter and the bony cortices, it turns out that with this orientation, I have a true short axis of the G med in this patient and a pretty good short axis, although not optimal, of the anterior of the G-meat itself, posterior band and anterior band. And so just because I'm already at this location, I'm gonna slide my probe posterior encephalad and just optimize that image of the G-meat. Again, posterior band, anterior band. The posterior band oftentimes can even be more prominent and rounded with uh, the muscle itself or muscular tendinous junction uh, can be very short and it's not unusual to see muscle here. So even though, again, we're focusing on the greater trochanter, um, I've already gotten the short axis of both the G-min and the G-med. And the, and the greater trochanter, again, is the, is the roadmap for understanding uh, the tendinous attachments. So again, I, I like to start off with the bony cortices of the greater trochanter. Now, a smooth trochanter with G-med problems um, is unusual. And reality is that we see a fair amount of cortical regularities in these companion cases. In this particular case, we see a very large bony projection between the anterior and lateral facet. Similarly on this with a fair amount of cortical regularity. Turns out that the extent of bony projections and, and in my experience with cortical regularities uh, is predictive of uh, the abnormalities you may see in the gluteal tendons. Again, somewhat anal analogous to the shoulder where if you see a fair amount of cortical regularities of the greater tuberosity, you can expect to see pathology of the rotator cuff. And the second structure I evaluate is the iliotibial band. And I evaluate the iliotibial band in two locations. The first is at the greater trochanter. Um, and you can see the somewhat fibular pattern of the iliotibial band to the right is distal, to the left is proximal. Now, there's a fair amount of heterogeneity in the IT band, and you can actually see muscle interposed with the IT band here, not to mistake it uh, for pathology. Now, distal, the IT band covers the vastus lateralis, and where the vastus lateralis attaches next to the greater trochanter, this is called the vastus tubercle. And I focus on that area there. And in this gentleman, it's fairly unremarkable. But again, in these two companion cases, you see uh, that we see bony projections and hypertrophic changes and essentially tenting and causing an undersurface fraying of the IT band. Now, any of you that have done a fair amount of ultrasound guided uh, bursal and greater trochanteric bursal injections know when the needle hits the IT band, it hurts uh, the patient. So clearly there's pain fibers in the IT band and in trying to put this puzzle together, uh, I'm not sure I understand fully what are the pain generators in greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Um, but my suspicion is that the IT band is an important pain generator. And actually in this patient right here, I'd ask them if I could put a small amount of local anesthetic right in this area, uh, and they were agreeable. And so I, I put a very small amount right here so it doesn't spread had the patient walk. When they came back, they said they were about 70 to 80% better. So again, I, I believe that the IT band um, is an important pain generator in greater trochanteric pain syndrome. And so again, this is the area I scrutinized the most uh, during my sonographic exam. Now, after I look at this area, I take the probe and slide it proximally in the same anatomic plane, which is an anatomic coronal plane, and I look at the proximal insertion of the IT band. And in our gentleman here, it's abnormal. And we see essentially enthesiopathic changes here where we see bony irregularity, fragmentation of the iliac crest, as well as hypochoic thickening of the insertion of the IT band. And again, it's important to give information. Is this a potential source of pain um, or is it not? It's a fairly superficial structure that we can comment on sonopalpatory pain. So then that completes my second, in a sense, my second paragraph of my report. My first paragraph is the anterior here. My second paragraph generally is commenting on the greater trochanter, the IT band. And so I start the second paragraph, laterally the greater trochanter is normal. IT band, the level of the greater trochanter is also normal. And then I talk about the enthesiopathic changes um, at the iliac crest. 
And then I also again say there is no corresponding pain with sonopalpation at this location. So after I scrutinize a greater trochanter in IT band, I go to the uh, G min tendon, which is anterior. And so we've also already have talked about uh, the short axis image and, uh, of the G min. <clears throat> and when we look at the greater trochanter, which is this image here, and so I'm going to rotate my probe 90 degrees and I'm getting this probe position. And so again, it's a coronal oblique, but also an axial oblique. And the probe is tilted posteriorly to match the face of the anterior facet <clears throat> to get this image right here. So in this image right here, we're seeing the tendon of the G min. Under leaf, this is the anterior hip capsule. And overlying is the uh, G med muscle, which I'll talk about a little further. Now, one thing I like to do when I first look at the long axis of the G min is I like to slide my probe anteriorly off the facet and then slide back on. And why do I do this? Because it assures me that I'm on the anterior facet and not the lateral facet. Because if there's a tear, especially a large tear of the G min, it can be confusing. So it orients me and confirms that I'm on the anterior facet. So this is just a video of me doing that in a different individual. So I'm sliding off the anterior, I'm still on it, now I'm off of it, and now I'm gonna get back on, I'm 100% sure I'm on the anterior facet, and I'm on, therefore, the G-min tendon. Now there's a couple details that I just like to talk about. So this is a normal G-min tendon, similar to the, uh, our gentleman. Um, and I wanna focus on two things. And one is the overlying G-min, or G-med, I'm sorry, muscle fibers. And so we see in this uh, dissection of the lateral hip, uh, the vascular loop is around the G-min tendon. So anterior is to the right and around the back is posterior. And we see the muscle fibers of the G-med come down and then have this insertion on the posterior aspect of the lateral facet. And it's these anterior fibers uh, that obliquely come to the tendon that go over the G um, min tendon. And so and we can see that right here. This for me is blocked out a little bit on our screen, but um, you can see again that the anterior fibers of the uh, G med uh, cover that of the G min tendon. And so you want to see that if, to confirm that you're in the right anatomic plane when evaluating uh, the long axis of the G-min. And then the second thing I like to uh, focus on is the musculotendinous junction. So here's a dissection now where the G-med has been removed, and this is all G-min, uh, posterior is to the left, anterior is to the right. Now the anterior fibers take a relatively straight course down to the anterior facet, whereas the posterior fibers have to have a fairly sharp turn to join in to form the tendon of the G-min. In fact, there's a 75 degree difference between the anterior and posterior fibers. So which means that the musculotendinous junction should not look clean because we have different orientation of fibers coming uh, to coalesce to form the G-min tendon. So this appearance is normal. And then the second thing about this area is this is ten, where pathology tends to start the majority of the time. And so I'd like to scrutinize this area um, because we start to see uh, changes in the echo texture and undersurface tears as the early pathology. And so in this companion case here, we see bony hypertrophic changes at the proximal aspect of the anterior facet. And we start to see increased hypoechodinicity in the undersurface tear develop um, of this G-min tendon. And here is the same image, but I have a, a comparison to the other side, which was nice because he was just starting with very early pathology here and then more advanced on the affected side. So with that in mind, we go back to our uh, G-min tendon and we see actually it's not quite normal. There's some increased hypoalkogenicity here and a very small early partial thickness tear developing. And so... My last paragraph discusses the G-min tendons and there is focal hypoalkogenicity in a small partial thickness undersurface tear of the G-min tendon at the proximal border of the anterior facet. So once I go and complete my G-min evaluation, I go to the G-med and I actually start with the posterior band and not the anterior band. 
And why do I do that? Well, let's look at this dissection here. And the posterior band um, to the left is posterior. It's, again, a fairly relatively straight fibers, and uh, whereas uh, fibers are more in an oblique orientation, inserting onto, again, the posterior aspect of the uh, lateral facet. And so if I was going anterior to posterior, I would hit this bare zone first before I got to the tendinous portion of the G med anterior band. And this bare zone can be confused with a tear, especially in the pr presence of a tear. And so to eliminate that confusion, I like to start posterior and go anterior. And so the orientation of my probe then is almost in a, uh, it would be an anatomic coronal oblique plane in, uh, in that sense. And so we, here we see the probe. Uh, the probe is tilted anteriorly. Oftentimes the cephalab portion is rotated just slightly posterior to optimize it. And then this is the image that we obtain in our gentleman. And we see this is the posterior superior facet. Uh, and it's a fairly stout attachment. It has a very strong attachment. When the posterior band tears, Patients experience a lot of disability and a turned down their gait. And again, in contrast to the anterior band, which is this, uh, the cephalide portion of the probe is rotated anteriorly. And so after I assess the posterior band, then I do go to the anterior band and start adjacent to the posterior band, but I do rotate my probe in the expected plane that I'm getting uh, for a long axis of the anterior band. And so again, I'm rotating uh, from the posterior band to the anterior band as I translate my probe anterior to avoid that uh, bare zone as I evaluate the tendon. Now, oftentimes patients, and, and this model is relatively straight, but if the model uh, is in a fetal position, this rotation is even more pronounced. And the normal appearance should be that of the G med muscle and it's, the anterior band is a central tendon. It's a bipennate configuration, and that central tendon should go deep to superficial, and it attaches onto the back of the lateral facet, as we've mentioned. And again, analogous to the G-min, the pathology typically starts at the proximal border where it goes over the, I call it the superior trochanteric crest, goes over this, and then inserts onto the back of this. And this is exactly what we see in our patients. So we see clear, diffuse hypochoic thickening of the uh, anterior band of the GME tendon and an extensive partial thickness on their surface tear right at that proximal border of the facet. And so oftentimes when I see a tear, I like to do dynamic images and I'll have the patient uh, either just gently abduct and just contracting the muscle sometimes can be enough. Or if it's too painful, I'll often have um, <clears throat> one of my staff just very uh, passively abduct uh, uh, the leg. And here we see, and then what I'm trying to understand is the extent of the tear. So it's not a full thickness tear here. It's a partial thickness tear um, of the anterior band of the G-Med. Now, one of the tricks I do, as, as we know, sometimes patients uh, have a, a large body habitus when we're examining the lateral hip. In the presence of a big tear, we can get lost. Um, so one of the tricks that I do is I'll slide the probe towards a greater trochanter and find the muscle, and I optimize a bipennate appearance, and then follow that central tendon bipennate to the greater trochanter. And oftentimes, we include a panoramic view uh, of the anterior band of the G-Med um, with our study. Um, and also, and the third reason is you, if there's a large tear, we can see the extent of atrophy uh, of the G-Med muscle. Now, I just want to mention that bare zone because I talked about it. And again, this is a dissection and, and the vascular loop is around the G-Min tendon. And this is the reflected G-Med uh, tendon muscle, and again, you can see the bare zone pretty clearly. It's between the G-min and the G uh, anterior band of the G-med, um, and again, it's nice to avoid this, uh, especially when you're first uh, starting out with this um, and not mistake uh, for a tear. Okay, and lastly, uh, after I evaluate the anterior band of the G, I'll just slide it distally over and more the posterior aspect of the tendon fibers of the G-Med anterior band. 
over the posterior facet, and I look at the IT band, and deep to the IT band is the greater trochanteric bursa. You can see in this patient's the thin line, um, and I, you can follow that down the posterior facet to be sure that you're in the right uh, plane to do that. Now, if I see a large tear, or if I see thickening or fluid of the greater trochanter, I'm very careful to look posteriorly because the trochanteric bursa is a fairly posterior structure, uh, and uh, you can miss it if you don't uh, purposely look posteriorly. In, in fact, it's easy to miss a fairly large uh, filled bursa unless you look posteriorly. And so the last paragraph, there's diffuse hypocoic thickening and moderate size partial thickness under surface tear of the anterior band of the uh, G mead. Uh, this corresponds to the maximal side of tenderness with sonopalpation. The posterior band of G mead is normal. The greater troke is normal. So which leads me to my report. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, there's a, a lot of preferences in how to do a report, and there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, this is just the way I do it. I try to do my reports the same way every time, um, so I'm not missing things. Um, and so here we see we have a diagnostic ultrasound on the right hip, attention to the lateral aspect. We've had discussion whether we should be put in complete exam or limited exam, and if you do put that, there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, it does make it more clear. Uh, I put the indications for it, I, the probe I use, uh, and if I use several probes, I list them. I talk about the correlation with, let's say, if an MR study or radiographs, and then I, as I mentioned, I divide into three sections, just the way I do it, the anterior hip, the IT band, the greater trochanter, and then the gluteal tendons and bursa. And so my conclusion, there's a degenerative type tear the anterior acetabular labrum. Talk about enthesiopathy of the sartorius and proximal IT band, but also qualify that as there was no pain with sonopalpation. It's a fairly superficial structure, so it's easy to <laughs> evaluate for this. Mild tendinosis with a small partial thickness tear of the G-min tendon, and then a tendinosis and moderate size partial thickness tear of the anterior band of G-med, which corresponds to the maximal side of tendinous. So take home points. Again, we've tried to emphasize the importance of reviewing radiographs prior to doing the sonographic evaluation, protocol-driven exams. And I've talked about the rationale for including the anterior exam in the lateral hip. Um, and again, we've discussed our protocols not only address those structures, but the differential diagnosis. In the, in the lateral hip, it's important to understand the planes uh, of the structures and correlate the findings with sonopalpatory information. In our institution, um, an ultrasound is a first-line advanced imaging for greater trochanteric pain, um, particularly at the anterior band and the G med, where it, it, it uh, has a fairly acute course as it goes over the greater choke, um, and that can be easily missed with an MR. And so I'll end there and uh, see if there's any comments, um, questions. Hey, it's Maderek. I'll hop in. Doug, great job. That was really, really amazing. Um, one question in your report. Um, one thing that I do a little differently, and I like your your opinion on it, is so I would probably change the the numbers in the opposite order. And so I tend to, especially in these things, you know, when you have like five different things, which is pretty common, right? When you're doing a complete exam, um, is I tend to put the thing that I think is clinically relevant, number one, and then like, you know, put the, like the acetabular labral tear, right? Like who cares, you know, in this guy's 64, uh, I would probably put that number five, just, just to kind of give it a little spin. I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do that, but do you ever consider like, you know, trying to, to prioritize your, your conclusions based on what you think is most clinically relevant, or do you just leave that entirely up to the referring provider to interpret? Um, I would say I do both. Um, and I think your point is well taken. And, and at times I do, I, you know, in trying to choose a case, um, this ended up having more stuff than I would like <laughs> to present a, a case, um, but it had some interesting points. But I, I, I think your that point is a valid point that you could prioritize. Um, when we do a lot of these, as you know, we just get into a habit, um, and that's just part of the habit. Is I look at, you know, the my report and then make my conclusions. But I think yes, I mean, uh, there there's good reasoning to that, uh, and um, so something people could consider. <laughs>
Hey Doug, it's it's Ryan. Just a, a quick question, um, and that was um, incredibly well done, like Maderick said. So I get a lot of larger folks with lateral hip pain, and and oftentimes they're sent over for a, for a dynamic scan to look for snapping lateral hip. And just curious if if you want to comment on your technique or any tips or tricks on how to how to best um, how to best uh, you know dynamically assess these folks for a, a quote unquote snapping you know lateral IT band over the trochanter. Sure. So yeah, I mean, in my experience is I get most of my requests for snapping hip from our pediatric orthopedist. Um, so for me, at least, it's unusual to see uh, adult this age with a sn snapping hip. Um, just to comment on larger individuals, you know, you got to be careful about calling things that are true or not true. And so I, I sometimes will say, you know, due to uh, enlarged body habitus, you know, there's significant image quality degradation, and then my report might say so-and-so tendons grossly intact, or this is a non-diagnostic study. For the patient with lateral hip pain, um, obviously in a snapping lateral hip, um, obviously they need to reproduce it um, fairly regularly, which a lot of the teenagers can do. And so if they can't do that laying down, um, I'll have them stand up. And, and I don't know what tricks I have other than I tend to use a lot of gel um, because it slides around. And I, I go over how the hip snaps first with the patient and try to do it in a way that has the least amount of motion. Um, so I, I guess that would just be my comment. Um, it's not easy sometimes uh, with that. And, and uh, fortunately, my last few snapping hips have, have been teenagers who um, are relatively skinny and it's, it's been pretty easy, but um, you're right. I mean, it can get challenging. And, uh, and it can the lateral hip can get challenging in, in, in large patients. And that's why I've, I've learned over time that the greater trochanter is my roadmap. I mean, sometimes you lose detail in larger patients. And so, but I can always see the facets and know where I am. Um, so that's why I've, I've focused a lot on the bony landmarks of the greater troch. Yeah, just one more comment with that. I, you know, I completely agree with Doug. And one thing I think that's hard for people, especially as they're starting off, is to feel confident enough in your own abilities to say that it's a limited study, right? And it's not you that's limited. It's just like that. It's just limited, like because of because a patient body habitus or whatever. And um, and like Doug said, you know, find the things you can find. Um, you know, find the bony landmarks. Find whatever. Um, and then determine what you can say and what you can't, and it's completely fine to leave it as that. And so sometimes we'll see, you know, very complex post-operative patients, and, um, and you might be limited in what you can say, and that's fine. That's nothing against you. Like, everyone's going to be limited in that, and being confident to just sort of, you know, spell that off is, I think, very helpful, you know, for your referring provider. And a lot of times, you know, they may want to just get, like, a very big picture question, too, like, you know, is the thing torn off completely or not? And you might be able to answer that question. Um, and don't, you know, get, get too down on yourself at getting in the weeds of trying to decide, you know, the little subtleties, because sometimes you just, you just can't, and that's fine. Um, and so I think that's one of the hard things, you know, to do. But, um, you know, as you move forward, just recognize that, you know, I mean, even Doug sometimes has to say, yeah, non-diagnostic study. Um, and that's better than, you know, than making up something, you know, in the report if you just can't see it, right? Yeah, good point, Maderick. Thank you. Other questions, comments? I find the lateral hip, hip exam, as I uh, was trying to understand it, hard. Um, over time, it's gotten easier, but I'm still challenged with it a couple of times. So, um, if you're doing a lot of these, you know, really dig into it. Um, be confident. Give yourself a break if you're not seeing things, and and just keep trying to study the different angles um, because I think ultrasound is is a very useful tool for greater trochanteric pain. Awesome. Thanks, Doug. That was that was that was fantastic. Um, so it looks like our next talk is going to be July 24th. Uh, ben Nelson's doing dorsal wrist, unless something has changed. But I think that's still the uh, still the plan for now. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming. Have a good Friday and a, a good weekend. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Doug.